but it's laborious to sit there and get enthusiastic and passionate and pretend you're seeing faces. Hate's too strong a word. I strongly dislike it compared to being here with you guys. This is so much, much better. See your smiling faces, getting some interaction, seeing your book fall apart. Um, all those things in live action. It's great. It's great. Well, this morning we're continuing with our um, Alpha series, our Alpha on Sunday series, um, uh, number six in our series. So I'll just ask you a question as we, as we launch. Would you risk your life to go to a foreign country, somewhere like Albania or um, China or somewhere, in order to take literature, literature secretly to the people there? Would you prepare to do that? Go there and risk your life, risk your freedom, to go and just take some literature to some people in those foreign countries. Yet this is what has been happening now for decades and decades. People have risked freedom and, yes, even life itself to bring the Bible to places where it is actually illegal even to own a copy of the book. And we should have a slide there um, of some, some people in those, some of those places and the, the transport of those Bibles. And does anyone know who's driving the V-dub? Who's that? Does anyone know who's in the V-dub? Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew. Brother Andrew from Open Doors. He is in that V-dub. Famously, he used that to uh, take Bibles all around Eastern Europe. And uh, whole organisations are developed. And you can see them on the slide there. Open Doors, Voice the Martyrs. They're just two of the most well-known. Um, they have involved thousands and thousands of people, millions and millions of Bibles, to do exactly what I mentioned in a coordinated way and with great, great, great success, particularly during the repression of the church in Russia and the Soviet bloc and the church in China. These men and women were taking Bibles to those hungry Christians so they could have a Bible in their possession. But why? Why does this happen? Well, because the book, this book, the Bible, is like no other book. No other book in the history of the world has been so loved and so hated, despised. No, there's no book like it. There's no book, you know, who gets passionate? You know, um, what's J.K. Rowling's book? In, uh, Harry Potter. Have you ever seen people get, oh, you know, get passionate about, I like Harry Potter, I don't like Harry Potter, what's it doing? People don't get that disturbed about Harry Potter. They might say, oh, I like it, I don't like it. But the Bible withdraws from people great emotion on both ends of the spectrum. Why? Because it's a book like no other. Way beyond any book, it's the most successful literary creation. If it was only a commercial product, it would be very, very successful. It is the most successful book ever. Every year, over 100 million Bibles, yes, you heard that right, 100 million Bibles either sold or given away. Given away. It was the best seller last year. It was the best seller the year before. And the year before, and the year before, it's not included in the best seller. You know they have best seller lists, you know, every year, every week they put out best seller lists. The Bible is not included. And there's a reason. Because it's the best seller every week. So it gets boring. What's the best seller this week? The Bible. It was the Bible last week. I know, it's going to be the Bible next week. And the week after, and the week after, and the week after. It's the most popular book in the world. But it's also the most powerful book in the world. It's not just popular because it's a nice read. It is powerful. No other book has produced such change in individuals or in nations. Whole countries have been changed through this book. You can't say that about Harry Potter or Winnie the Pooh. I know it's a great book, but it hasn't produced change in people and nations. But the Bible has. It's the most powerful, most precious book of all. Psalm 19 and verse 7 and 10 says this, 
The law of the Lord, this book, is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. And I'll skip over to verse 10. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. So the honeycomb, if you're singing the old King James chorus. Who knows that chorus? Yes, we do. Some of us do. Some of us do. The Queen of England at a coronation is handed a copy of the Bible with these words. We present you with this book, the most valuable thing which the world affords. Imagine that. At the crowning of a king or a queen, we give you this book because it is the most valuable thing that we can give you. Not gold, not silver, but this book. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, people do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the word of God. What was Jesus saying there? He was saying that material things alone can't satisfy. Who's found that? You buy yourself a new car, you drive it, smells nice. I've never had a new car, by the way, but smell. But I've ridden in them. Smells nice. Not long before, mm, still enjoy it, still nice to have it, but it hasn't got that sparkle. Unless you're a Toyota person, then it says you've still got the feeling, you know. <laughs> but really, material things only satisfy for a time. Even relationships only satisfy to a point, to a point. I have a good marriage, I have a lovely marriage, I have a lovely wife, but Josie, my relationship only satisfies to a point. It's not the be-all and end-all of our whole lives. It can't be. There's something, there's got to be something more, even in our greatest relationships. There's a spiritual hunger which only can be satisfied by something spiritual. And Jesus says that that is the word that will come out of God's mouth, the word recorded for us in the Bible. And this is the primary way that God communicates with us is through his word. God has spoken, it's his revelation. Yes, I know God speaks by his Holy Spirit and <clears throat> we have words of knowledge, words of wisdom, words of prophecy, words of encouragement. But the primary way that God speaks to us is through this Bible. And anything we hear by other means must fit this, not the other way around. Oh, but someone gave a great word at church once and it, and, and, and it was a bit different to what the Bible says. Well, chuck it out. I'm serious. have nothing to do with it. It's not an authentic word because it doesn't marry with this. It must marry with this. There's no exception. But it was so wonderful and it, it made me think of, I, I don't care. It doesn't marry with this. Chuck it out. Chuck it out. But, but it was, he's a famous event. I, I don't care who he is. don't care who she is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. No ministry, no matter how many Learjets he's got, is above this word. Or how many Learjets he hasn't got. He's not above this word. This is the primary way God speaks to us. Can you that? Yeah. The Bible brings revelation because God has spoken. God has spoken. Sometimes people say, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he show himself to us? Why doesn't he reveal himself to us? The answer is he has. He absolutely has. God has revealed himself, first of all, in creation. Before there was ever a Bible, God revealed himself in creation. The fact that we're here is revelation of the reality of God. That there's something rather than nothing. The, the secular says once there was nothing. Ah, talk about faith. There was nothing, now there's something. I was sitting in my eye surgeon's office the other day and being kept waiting as one often is and um, I'm looking at his charts on the wall. You know the chart. Who's seen the charts with the layers of the eye? And all that kind of, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, wow. And it all just happened by chance. That's amazing. And so I'm trying to work up my faith to believe in this. 
But it could happen by chance. And I must confess, I found my, my faith was failing. I couldn't believe for that. I couldn't believe for evolution and say all those layers could happen by chance and all the different functions they have. And if everything work, does, if, unless everything works, nothing works. If I could take out a bit of bits of those layers, your eye, oh, guess what? You wouldn't be able to see anymore. And yet it all happened by chance. There was a slime in a bog. He jumped out of the bog. He had a, he had a, he had a little socket in his head somewhere. He, he had to get a head first. Socket in his head. And over millions of years, there was a fleshy thing that was caught, became an eye. That's just so nonsensical. It's beyond belief. I admire the faith of evolution. It's a mighty faith. It really is. But I can't, I can't, get, in, I can't get involved in it. So creation. There is a, even beyond, there's a hunger in every human heart that searches for God. God has even implanted something in there that says, hey, you're not going to be happy with just what's around you. And human history has found that to be true. That's why the church never goes away. That's why spiritual hunger never goes away in any nation. People have always got a spiritual hunger. God has also revealed himself in a person. And we looked at that over the last few weeks. He's revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. But we only know fundamentally about Jesus because of this book. This book fills in the gaps, if you like, or gives us the whole picture. The New Testament, of course, is all about Jesus and the Old Testament is actually all about Jesus too, but it's the unfolding, as the un New Te Old Testament unfolds and all the types and all the patterns and all the sacrifices, they all point to Jesus. That's why you don't need to become Jewish and go and one day go to the temple and sacrifice so you can be a, per you can be a fulfilled Christian in doing Jewish stuff. You don't have to. It's all been fulfilled. Jesus hung on the cross and said something very significant. It is finished. It's done. Don't chase after Judaism anymore, he said. Don't chase after sacrifices and rituals. I've done it. You've got access. In fact, I'll show you. I'll even rip the curtain in the temple from top to bottom, not bottom to top like a person would do, but from top to bottom, the curtain that's 60 foot up in the air, an inch thick, God did it, to say this is over. The way to the holy place is open. Isn't that great? God, the, all these little things, little things, big things that God does just to, to, to sort of just hammer the nail into our understanding. So when you look at the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus, we see it's also all about Jesus. Science is the exploration of how God has revealed himself in creation. That's why science is so amazing and relevant and great. There's nothing wrong with science. We're not anti-science as Christians. We shouldn't be. Science is great. Science is what gave you the jab to help us get over this terrible virus. So science is the exploration of God's revelation in creation. Theology is the, ex is the exploration of how God has revealed himself in Jesus and in the Bible. And there's no conflict. There's no conflict. Albert Einstein was one of the greatest scientists of all time. And he said this, a legitimate conflict between science and religion cannot exist. Doesn't exist. Religion without science is blind. In other words, we're not seeing the whole picture. We're cutting out science from our religious view. And he said, don't do that. But he also said, science without religion is lame. And he wasn't using lame as in 70s kid lame. He was saying, it's limping along. It's not getting, it's not its full potential. He wasn't saying, lame, like a teenager says. That's lame. Do they still say that? I don't know. Maybe they don't. Maybe we said it when we were teenagers. But he said, science without religion is lame. We need both. Science answers the how and when questions how and when questions, the Bible answers the who and why questions. Who and why? Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 3.16, scripture we've all memorised, all scripture is inspired by God. It's God-breathed. 
that the literal translation of the word inspired is breath. God breathed, God inspired, God breathed. Pope Francis, uh, in his first official document that he, that he produced as Pope, was called the joy of the gospel. I didn't know the Catholics went to the joy of the gospel. Yeah, they are. Yeah, they are. Don't miss it. They are. And he said this, We do not blindly seek God or wait for him to speak to us first, for God has already spoken. And there is nothing further we need to know which has not been revealed to us. Let us receive the sublime treasure of the revealed word. Man, sounds like a Christian, doesn't he? Amazing. I think he is. Of course, there were human authors. God inspired those human authors over a period of 1,600 years. There are at least 40 authors, 40 human authors involved. There were kings, poor people, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, and even a doctor was thrown in for Emma's benefit. So we'd have a medical person there so she could relate. <laughs> I don't know which one part I'm relating to. Fishermen? Maybe. Fishermen? <laughs> so they wrote different kinds of literature too. There's history there, there's poetry, there's prophecy and there's letters. And we can spend a lot of time on that. That's why when we read the Bible, we've got to see what am I reading? Am I reading a letter? Am I reading history? Am I reading prophecy? Am I reading poetry? Because who knows, you don't read poetry the same way as you read a letter from somebody. Who's heard about poetic license? It's a real thing. You create word pictures. Okay? Like we know, Jesus isn't actually a lamb. Right? Lamb of God. But Jesus isn't really a lamb. Okay? We, we know that, don't we? Great. Great. Because it's po there's poetic and prophetic aspects. So all this book, this whole Bible we're reading, is 100% the work of human authors. Human authors, 100%. Didn't magically appear on the page. Human authors. Human authors. But it claims to be 100% inspired by God. So how do those things work together? If I'm telling you every word in this Bible was written by a, a person, a human being, how can we say it's 100% inspired? Well, here's an illustration to help us with understanding. I've got a picture here of Sir Christopher Wren. I never met him. Jeff may have, I don't know. But <laughs> no, he didn't know. He's, he did never met him. He never met him. <laughs> and Jeff never had a wig like that. But anyway, that's Sir Christopher Wren. And some of you will know, maybe all of us know, that that's a picture of St. Paul's Cathedral. Anyone been there? Yes, great building. I got right up the top with Josie around that cupola thing. Not sure I was supposed to be there. Police, the police said I wasn't supposed to be there. Um, no, I'm joking. Uh, but we were there. But So this was built. Who has said? Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral. Who said that? It's true. He built it. He was the greatest English architect of his time. He started at the age of 43. And for 36 years, the cathedral was built by Sir Christopher Wren as the architect. It was complete in 1711 when Christopher Wren was 79 years old. So he built St. Paul's Cathedral. Did he lay a single stone? No. Did he hammer in a single nail? No. But everyone says Christopher Wren built St. Paul's Cathedral. We don't hear about Billy the blacksmith who hammered in a nail. It's a Christopher Wren. He was the inspiration behind it all. He breathed life into that through his drawings, through his creativity, through his design, and so it is with the Bible. Many, many, 40 different authors, <laughs> but one architect, one inspiration behind it all, God himself. And that doesn't mean there are no difficulties with the Bible. When we read the Bible, and particularly some of you read the Old Testament, you say, oh, that's shocking, I don't understand that. Why did God do or allow that? There are sometimes moral difficulties, historical difficulties, there are apparent contradictions. 
There's all kinds of stuff. And, and we might say, well, how can that be inspired by God? Well, again, to illustrate, it's a bit like suffering and the love of God. To, to be a Christian, you have to believe that God loves us, right? Yes. But to be a Christian, we also have to acknowledge that there's suffering in the world, right? Yes. You can't ignore it. So I'm a Christian, God loves me, and I refuse to look at any suffering. Ukraine, don't want to see it, don't want to know about it. Someone's got cancer, don't tell me about it. I'm a Christian and I don't accept suffering. Of course, that's nonsensical. Of course, we accept and know suffering. How do we hold together the, the love of God and, this, and all the suffering in the world? The same way we hold together inspiration of God and some of the difficulties we have with what we read. And it's not easy at times. We don't, have, we don't have to pretend as Christians that we've ticked all the boxes, this faith thing's easy. That I understand it all. I don't understand it all. And I'm the one giving the talk at the moment. I don't understand it all. And I don't expect I will in my lifetime. I don't expect it. It's a bit like a crossword puzzle. We start, we've all done crossword puzzles, and we start with the clues we understand, don't we? We find, oh yeah, I know what's on the end of a dog, a tail. Yeah, I know that. And so we, we fill that answer in. And then we get to, what's the former, what's the uh, former name of Istanbul? And we might scratch our head about, yes it is. So we might scratch our head about that. We won't have to now because Regina's giving you the answer. But it's a bit like that. So we do all the, we do all the things we know and then we stop and sometimes because we've got some letters we start to fill in some of the other gaps. We all know how it works. But we don't stop. We move on to the next clue. We move on to the next clue. And so it is with the Bible. As we wrestle with the stuff that we don't quite get and we've all got that stuff, over the years we begin to understand more and more. And it's not that all the difficulties go away. They don't. The crossword puzzle's not finished yet, you see. The crossword puzzle for you and me of understanding God and his word, that's not done. Don't expect you're going to be able to tick the last box and fill in the last clue because you won't be able to. Just rest in that. Relax in that. Don't be so hungry for understanding and, and knowledge that you're sort of insatiable. I've got to go as much, as much, as much as I can because I'm not satisfied so I know it all. Well, relax. You're not going to know it all. You're never going to know it all. But wrestle with the difficulties. You know, uh, pray about it. But don't chuck it away because, oh, well, I don't understand that thing about, you know, what happened with Esau and Jacob, so I'm not going to believe the Bible anymore. Well, that's silly. That's silly. I don't understand everything about electricity. I'm still happy to flick the switch. I don't wait for full understanding. You know, we had Josh in fixing up the switchboard and he was talking to me about stuff and I was going, hmm. Hmm, yeah, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> I don't understand anything about electricity, but I'm quite happy to flick the switch, quite happy to plug the vacuum cleaner in. Josie's not there. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> you don't have to understand it. How many people here fully understand the modern car and its electronics and its computer setup? No, we don't. We get in the car, we turn the key or we push the button, we drive it quite happily without a full understanding. And yet when it comes to something as important as the Bible, we say, oh, I'm not going to accept it unless I can fully get it, even though it's the revelation of God, who is the biggest thing in the universe. But if I don't get everything about the biggest thing in the universe, I'm not going to have a little bit of it. And yet with a silly thing like a car, we say, oh, no, I'll go along with the car thing. See how it just doesn't, it's illogical. And you're not logical people, you're very logical. So get with it. The Bible, take hold of it. Get what you can from it. And we need to remember that Jesus is the interpretive key. If it doesn't fit with Jesus, we have to say, well, how are we going to interpret this? Because Jesus is supreme love. We all know he's the supreme revelation of God. If you want to know what God's like, He's like Jesus. So we filter everything through that lens. How do I get this? Well, 
I don't understand this, but I know God is love. And I know Jesus is a full revelation of that love. God, what does this mean in the light of that? Because I can't discard that to try and understand this. And then we might just breathe a bit easy. Breathe a bit easy. So the Bible is the revelation of God. It's, it's complex sometimes, but it is authoritative. It is authoritative. Paul said, we read the first part of this before, all scripture is inspired by God. It's useful to teach us what is true, to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. That's the New Living Translation. In other words, it's our authority for what we believe and how we will live our life. As in the Catholic Church used to put it when I was growing up, it is the, the supreme uh, guide of faith and practice. Supreme guide of faith and practice. And that's what it is, what we, what we believe and how we live. Jesus summed it up for us all. God loves you, so love God and love your neighbour. You know, you can just spill the whole Bible to that. Really? God loves us, so love God back. And when you're done with that, or as you're working on that, also love your neighbour. Do those things. But then it's also full of lots of practical wisdom, advice and guidelines of how we live our life. It gives us boundaries. I love reading, um, particularly I love reading the Psalms and Proverbs, just some of those practical things it says there about living life. And so many of the letters gave us practical things. To the early church, Paul says, look, you guys are making a mess of this. Do this. I'll give you some practical ideas. Because they needed that. We need that. Some of those people say, uh, oh, it's a rule book. And I don't want to follow a rule book. That'll take away my freedom. Surely if, if I follow this, I'll lose my freedom. But actually we need boundaries. Have you ever tried to play a game where the referee didn't know the rules? No, it's, it's a nightmare. I've played in those footy games. I've played in those basketball games. And everyone ends up fighting and fouling because there's no, the, the rules are not being observed. Have you ever driven in a country like Haiti or India where the rules are just a handy hint? The road rules are just a handy hint. <laughs> Look, we just basically like you to keep your four wheels on the road somewhere. And even that rule is not very well followed. We, that's very dangerous. You know, God did not say don't commit adultery because I don't want you to, I don't want you to stop having fun outside of marriage. That wasn't his idea. He said, oh no, people are going to have a lot of fun outside of marriage, so I'll put a stop to that. I'll say you can't commit adultery. No, God did these things to save us from what? Pain. From pain. Not to, not to take away our freedom. It's a nightmare when we try to operate as if there is no Rule. True freedom comes when we know that God is control and there are boundaries. When children grow up without boundaries, they're insecure, they're unhappy. We all know, or maybe we don't all, some of us would know, of the experiment they did in the 70s with schools. They said fences around schools were repressive and, um, and, a, and I think it was a couple of um, boroughs in America. They experimented by taking down all the school fences. And the immediate response was the kids huddled in the middle of the school playground. Whereas when the fences are there, we all see it. Where the kids are, they're hanging off the fence and they're all over, they're playing everywhere. But when they took away the fences, the kids felt insecure and in danger and they all just played in the centre of the area. That's thoroughly all I expect primary kids to do. Wouldn't you? And that's what happened. Because we enjoy... Boundaries. We like boundaries. It works for us. One man said, well, I don't read the Bible because it interferes with my work. And I said, well, what's your job? He said, well, I'm a pickpocket. <laughs> but that's God's love for us. He's given us this book. It's inspired. It's authoritative. It's the word of God because God has spoken. But also, the Bible's uh, the revelation of God he speaks to us, but also it's a way of building relationships. Because the Bible is like a love letter from God. When we get a letter from someone we love and 
Probably most of us have had that at some time. You know, you treasure that letter not because of the letter itself, it's because of the person who wrote it. And that's the same with the Bible. This book of itself, paper and ink, is nothing of itself. It's not. It's nothing of itself. Some of you are a bit disturbed when you're saying that. But of itself it is nothing. It is because of who wrote this love letter. Who wrote it. That's how it becomes valuable. It becomes important. Now, we could print something that looks like this, but if it's not from God, it's not a love letter from God, then it wouldn't be as valuable because of the author. And the author wants to be in relationship with us. And he tells us how, and that's why it's precious. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said in John 5, 30, 39 to 40, you diligently study the scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. By just reading the Bible. These are the scriptures that testify about me, about Jesus. And yet you refuse to come to me and have life. The whole point of this book is so you can be a friend of Jesus. That's the whole point. So you can be a friend of Jesus, have a relationship with him. The book itself is a means to that end. Suppose we were to buy a new Mazda and when we get there, there's a manual inside. And I got out the manual and I said, wow, what a great book this is, this Mazda manual. What a fantastic book. So I start, I start reading it, underlining it. I even get a felt pen and I underline bits that really interest me. Tire pressure, that's great, steering. I thought, wow, this is a great book. I wonder if I could learn this by heart. That'd be great. So I learned certain sections of by heart. Maybe I can set some of this Mazda manual to music. That'd be nice. And you know, other people love Mazdas. And maybe there's people who love the Mazda manual as much as I do. I think I'll start the Mazda manual club and we'll get together. Hey, and that's a Japanese book. Japanese mod. I wonder if there's an original version of it in Japanese. And I can learn Japanese. And I can read the Mazda manual in the original language. That'd be good. That'd be good. And you'd say to me, but that's not what it's all about. The point of the manual is to drive the car in the way that the maker intended. The point of the Bible is that we have a relationship with Jesus, first and foremost. Is there anything wrong with writing songs from it? No, of course there's not. Is there anything wrong with memorising it? Of course not. And learning it off by heart, all those things, under nothing wrong with all of that. But if we do all that and we miss out on a relationship with Jesus, we've missed the whole point. And sadly, that's somewhere some of our theological colleges have gone. They're great at studying it, but they even deny the reality of God in the midst of their study. And they're a long way from relating to Jesus through their study. They've missed the point. And we don't want to miss the point, do we? We don't want to miss it all. We, we, want, to, we want to come into relationship with God through it. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. So if we say, I want to have faith, because we asked that question a few weeks ago, I'd say, well, read this book. And I'd say to a person who said, I want to have faith, look, let me give you a letter written by, or, or an account written by John, a disciple of Jesus. And that will tell you all about Jesus. Just read the Gospel of John. That's what it's called. Because they might not even know that. Good news. My John about Jesus. Read that. Just start reading that. And faith comes by hearing. So many people uh, have had faith arise as they what? Read this book. Because it's powerful, it's different, it's not like any other book. John says at the end of his gospel, in John 20, verse 31, These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let me say that again. This is written, that purpose you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing the next step, you may have life in his name. It's not a museum piece. 
It's not just a study manual. It's that you might believe and you might have faith in Jesus. That's what it's all about. It's the bottom line. The rest is the icing on the cake, if you like. Great icing, wonderful icing, but that's the purpose. The whole point I've written this gospel, says John, is that you might have faith. I've been a Christian for 48 years, thereabouts, and I've, I've read some of this book practically every day. I'm very grateful I came into Christ through, through a friend, and that friend's father was evangelical pastor in a previous ministry, and he taught me right in the beginning, gave me uh, Mountain Trailways for Youth and um, that other one that's got the green cover, and told me, you've got to have a quiet time every day, John. I said, well, what's that? And he told me about reading a bit of the Bible every day and praying at the start of my day. Fred Reynolds. He's with the Lord now, but he, he taught me that, and I've done that every day since. I feel a bit that I haven't really started my day. I refuse Facebook. I, the only thing I look at before I start my day, I'll be honest, I look at my messages to see if any of you have passed away overnight and you didn't know about it. So I look at my messages. I just look at a very quick cursory look at my messages. I don't go into it more than that. And I go straight to my Bible reading. Don't go to Facebook. Don't go to the news. First stop, the Word of God. That's, that works for me. I don't know about you, but that works for me. I'll be doing it all my life. It's like why I have breakfast every day. I like breakfast. I don't want to miss breakfast, so I have it every day. And that's very much like reading the Bible. I do it because I like it. I'm not slavish. I never feel slavish about my Bible reading. And some people, I think, their problem with Bible reading is they try to read five chapters at the start of the day. Don't do that. Read five verses and pray about those. That's, 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 that's you know, that's plenty to, to hear from God, you know. If you've got time to read five chapters, maybe you're retired, I don't know, then great. But start, not that retired people got all the time in the world, but I'm not digging myself in a hole here, but, but get that spiritual food. Pastor Rick Warren said this, reading the Bible generates life, it produces change, it heals hurts, it builds character, it transforms circumstance, it imparts joy, it overcomes adversity, it defeats temptation. It infuses hope. It releases power. And it cleanses the mind. Anyone need any mind cleansing? Yes. So, just as I close, how do we hear God speak through the Bible? Firstly, make a plan. Time is our most valuable possession. We can get more money, but we can't get more time. Can I suggest setting aside a time? Make a plan. Maybe just set aside 15 minutes a day. Start of the day, I recommend, but any time during the day might be lunchtime. And then a place, a plan and then a place. Jesus went to a solitary place. I have a solitary place where I go to. Some of you know where it is, in my garden there, under my little tower or awning or whatever it is. Um, it's our garden, it's a space. And even if it's raining, I can go into that place. A different part of the place, but I can go there expecting God to speak to me. I have a coffee with me, I have my Bible app usually, and praying that God will speak to me in my day. And then find a pattern. So I have a plan, I'm going to do it, get a place to do it, and then find a pattern. There are many, many different ways you can. I've mentioned this before. Can I recommend to you, if you haven't already done this, download the Version Bible app. Go to Play Store. I don't often do that. You can go there now if you like. Go to Play Store and type in Version Bible app. It's free. It's great. And then in there you can pick a reading plan. I'm doing the Bible in one year, 2022. But there are dozens and dozens. Some go for a month. Some go for a week. Some are Bible reading. Seven days on overcoming your anger. You can do a Bible reading on that. Seven days on... Filling with joy, whatever it is, you'll find something for your Bible reading. Listen, in 2022, with you've all got mobile phones, 
If there's one or two who haven't, okay. But you've pretty much all got mobile phones. There is no, 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 no excuse. Can I say it again? No, 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 no excuse for not having the Bible on your phone and it being accessible. No excuse. Real. If you've got a, if you've got a mobile phone that's got data, you should have the Bible on your phone. Okay? You can listen to it. He'll even speak to you. You can do like the Bible in one year. If I want to, I can press the button there and Nicky Gumbel will speak it all to me for 10 minutes and I can sit there with my eyes closed and just listen to it. Say, so, John, can I listen to Bible reading and still call it Bible reading? Yes. God is not going to look, oh, you're not, you haven't got your eyes open. That doesn't count. <laughs> no, it's getting the word into you by whatever means. So get that pattern. You might use the Bible reading that's on the back of our newsletter. Look, it's there for you on the back of the newsletter. You don't even need to cross the road. There it is. You can read that every day of the week. There's lots of ways. I think we've got to be honest with ourselves. Let's have a little honesty moment here. If we're honest with ourselves, if we're not having a daily Bible reading, because we all agree it's important, the word that springs to mind for me starts with L. Can anyone else think of it? What is it? Oh, wow, you got it. Lazy. Let's be honest with ourselves. We've got the time. We've got the tools. We just need not to be so lazy. We just need not to be so lazy. Just a pastoral word to you. Please don't be offended by that. If we're honest with ourselves, we can only come to that conclusion because we've got time We've got means. We're not doing it. I reckon you all had lunch yesterday and dinner last night. Most of us watched a Netflix show or something. What if we just paused the Netflix for 15 minutes and read our Bible and then got back to it again? You would have done your Bible reading. You're saying you're so harsh. So I'm trying not to be harsh, but I'm trying to get the point across. We all need to read our Bibles daily. We all can. Okay, I've laboured the point enough. Okay. The best reading plan, I've said it before, is the one you will do. Not mine, not someone else's, the one you'll do. Sometimes I'm talking with Christians having a bit of a struggle and I ask them, do you have a daily Bible reading? And almost without exception, the answer is no. No. But reading the Bible daily is life-changing. It can change your life for good. And then as you read your Bible, this is how you do it. Ask yourself three questions. What does it say to me? What is it saying? So what's it basically saying? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to me where I'm at? And then how does it apply to me? How can I do something about that? Pray about what you discovered. Put these discoveries from the Word into practice in your life. Everyone can write down those five things and everyone can do those five things. You can have picked up the Bible for the first time in your life. You can be a brand new Christian, which none of us are, but you can be a brand new Christian, pick up the Bible for the first ever time, start in John's Gospel, read five verses and say, what does that say? And you can answer that. What does it, what does it mean? You can answer that. How does it apply to me? You can answer that. And then you can pray about what you've discovered and come across it. I hope I haven't come across as harsh or mean. Um, but these are serious things. There's hardly anything more serious than putting the word of God into our lives. Really. Hardly anything else I can think about. Okay. Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you that it's so freely available to us. Lord, there are people across the world who would just give everything to have one of our Bibles, a book of our Bibles. And Lord, we have it on tap. We have it on phone. We have it on computer. Lord, we have access overload. So Lord, help us to take hold of what you've graciously given to us and let us go forward with gratitude using what you've given to us. Because, Lord, it's going to be important for us. It's going to change our lives. 
in so many ways. Lord, use your word to create impact in this world through us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.